Okay, so um, let's get started. So thank you all to um, those who are joining us today for this parent workshop where we will be sharing evidence-based phonics strategies you can use at home with your early or even struggling readers. Um, today, Natalie will share some strategies, some games, some you know really easy to implement strategies to strengthen the sound symbol link in your um, early readers or struggling readers brain. There'll also be a time for an open Q&A after the presentation portion of the workshop. And so we'll transition from the presentation to a Q&A portion um, later on. Um, so to get started, I love to introduce our speaker um, for today, which is Natalie. Lisa Laurel. She is the lead clinician at Strategies for Learning. Um, Natalie holds a master's in English education from NYU and brings her expertise in structured literacy instruction to strengthen students' phonemic awareness. And as a reading specialist, Natalie pairs explicit, systematic, and data-informed instruction with her inquiry-based, student-oriented, um, and joyous learning experiences. Um, so with all of that being said, I will pass it on to Natalie and then I will have her take the lead. Um, Natalie, I think you're still on mute. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, Natalie, you're still, um, we still can't hear you. Headphones. Okay, perfect, yeah. Right. It worked like a few minutes ago. <laughs> I look silly with the headphones anyway. It just allows me to sort of back up because it has a microphone, but I, um, that's okay. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can hear you great. Excellent, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and um, and welcome. I, um, as Christine was talking, I was getting some of my materials ready because some of what I'll show you today are things I actually use with students, and I was just getting them organized. So I'm very excited for today's session, and thank you all for being here. Um, I know we got a few questions uh, ahead of time, so I have a sense of what many of you are sort of looking for out of today, um, but let me sort of give you a sense of where we're going and, and how we'll get there. So um, we this is a five part session. We'll start with talking about what makes reading so difficult and to see if some of that resonates with you and if you're seeing it either in yourselves as readers or in your students or kids at home. Um, we'll talk a little bit of background about what is the science of reading. It's become this kind of buzzy term that you may be hearing a lot. Some of us are very well versed, others are not. You may start to see it reflected in your school curricula or not. And so we'll give just a quick little overview to inform the rest of today. And then part three and part four are just giving you tips and tricks. So I'm literally going to go under my doc cam and show you some things that you can do at home with students that are fun, that are engaging, and um, that can hopefully eliminate some of the frustration that you're seeing and help provide you with a toolkit that you can use at home. And then finally, as Christine said, we'll kind of wrap up and have have a Q&A session. Um, so with that, let's get started. So I want you to think for a moment about what makes reading so difficult, and specifically, what makes reading English, um, whether it's your native language or your second or third language, so difficult for all of us. And in doing so, I'm going to have us all pretend for a moment that we are brand new language learners to a fake language that I'm gonna teach you a few letters of. And as you're going through the simulation, I really want you to think about what the experience of a new reader or emergent reader is like. Um, for those of us who work with dyslexic kids or who might have dyslexic kids at home or might be dyslexic ourselves, some of this might resonate particularly with you as we go through the code. Now, disclaimer, I am not going to be demonstrating through the simulation 
uh, best teaching practices. And so I would highly advise you as you go through this as a new reader, don't do as I do. All right, here we go. So put on your learner cap for a moment. So welcome, friends. We are going to learn some new letters today. This is the first letter of the day, and this letter's name is boop. Say the letter name. Good. And the sound that this letter makes is make that sound. Good. Make the sound. Nice job. Okay, so what's this letter name? Yep, boop. And what sound does it make? Excellent. Good. Here's our next letter of the day. This letter's name is flat. What's the name? Good, flat. So the letter name is flat, but the letter sound is I. Make that sound. Good. Pay attention to your mouth shape for a moment. What are you noticing your mouth is doing when you make I? I. Good, yeah, you're sort of smiling and your mouth is a little bit tight. I. Good, so the letter name is flat. What sound does it make? I. Good, so we've got two letters so far. I think we're ready for our third letter of the day. Are you ready? This letter's name is X. Say the name. Good, and X makes the sound t. What sound does X make? T. Good, tell the people around you, what sound does it make? T. Terrific. So we've just learned three new letters. Let's go ahead and review those. We had the first letter. What letter name was it again? Right, boop, what sound? Good, let's go to the second letter. What name? Mm -hmm. Flat, and what sound? I, right, so we have k, I. And then third letter, what was the name? Right, X, what sound does X make? T. Good, so let's tap out our three sounds together. Follow those dots, k, I, t. Let's blend that sound, that word, kit. What's the word? Good, let's practice blending and segmenting that again. Ready? K I T kit. Good. So we've just added those three letters to our knowledge of our um, alphabet that we've been learning over the past few weeks. We've done a letter a day and we always do the name and then the sound. So now that you know how to read that first word, go ahead and look back into your code and see if you can decode the sentence. I'll give you a minute, go ahead. Hmm, are you using your resources and looking back at words you know? Wonder if anyone in the chat can write the sentence. Okay, take about 30 more seconds. Keep reading through. Remember, oh, in this language, we read right to left. Yep. Okay, 10. Nine, eight, seven. Let's see, Christine, do you see anyone in the chat? I don't see anyone in the chat that hasn't read yet. No, I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I don't see anyone in the chat. <laughs> okay, well, we know our first word, right? It, kit. What was the second word? What sound does this one make? Er, a, n, ran. Okay, we have kit, ran. Let me show you the sentence just because we're running out of time. It's almost time for lunch. Here's the sentence. Oh, yes, Malik, well done. Malik got it. It's kit, ran, and hid. That's right. Okay, and scene. So uh, you saw how difficult it was how rushed it was and how in the moment you had to not only remember the naming of letters, which I gave you first, which by the way, did any of the names of those letters include the sounds that they actually make? No, so many of the letter names we have don't actually involve the sound that they make in words and that can be confusing. And then you had to individually remember their sounds and then blend them into a word and then remember the past code that I taught you. Now, in English now, you can see we're going left to right. This word, or sorry, this sentence would be called decodable, meaning your students, once they kind of learn a one-to-one -one correspondence, what sound each letter can make, they can read and blend this on their own. The vowels are all going to be short. 
there are not any tricks here of spelling. And so this is what we call a decodable sentence. However, once we move beyond decodable text, your students are going to start to see words like choir, parallelogram, said, chlorophyll, and give. All of these words feel like they're breaking one of those rules that we learn early on in kindergarten. And as a new reader or a struggling reader, it is so frustrating when I learn one rule and I cannot apply it to other words in the future. Why is it that choir doesn't say ch for ch or ch for chlorophyll? Why is it that give is not pronounced gyve if I've just learned that magic E at the end makes the vowel before it say its name? What is going on with said? <laughs> and why is it AI if I know AI as a vowel T makes the A vowel sound? Parallelogram has schwa in it and so many different syllables that I have to remember. And that first syllable pair really should be par because it's vowel R based on the rules that I have. English specifically is so frustrating because our language is influenced by multiple other languages that also influenced our spelling. Choir and chlorophyll are written with a CH at the beginning that makes the K sound because they're from Greek. And so our kids have to learn all of that in order to internalize the patterns and become fluent readers. And you can imagine how difficult it is for someone who's not a native English speaker or speller um, having to learn all of those rules and patterns and then also learning when to ignore the rule or when to break the rule to read the word. So this leads us to a little bit about the science of reading, which really is just research about how the brain develops the capacity to read. The more we understand about how our kids' brains develop the capacity to read, the more we know how to help them. Our brains are not hardwired naturally to read. We are hardwired for oral language, right? That's why think about if thinking about your own kids for a moment or your own students or your friends' kids or grandkids, when they start talking and they're repeating after you and they start to develop oral language, that is innate. That's going to come. But the capacity to read, to make the link between sounds and symbols, that is not natural. And that has to be explicitly taught by teachers. But a lot of the programs that we've been using over the last few decades with our students do not explicitly teach the code or how to make that link between sounds and symbols. And that's why a lot of kids end up guessing at whole words because they're really smart and they're able to use context and they've been coached to do so. Um, or like for many of the students that I work with or that you might see at home, um, they just feel exasperated and it feels impossible. One thing to know about the science of reading is this idea called the simple view of reading, which we're gonna talk about as we get into our skills today. The simple view of reading has been around since 1986 and it's a simple multiplication problem. It says that reading is the product of code-based skill. So that's your sounds, your letters, and your sight word recognition, or the ability to quickly recall and recognize words. And language comprehension, so vocab, background knowledge, uh, knowledge about story structure and grammar and syntax that falls under language comprehension. So those two things times each other equal reading proficiency. You cannot get to reading proficiency if you're not strong in either of these camps. For a lot of our dyslexic kids, they are very strong in language comprehension. They often have awesome vocabularies because they're overcompensating for their lack of word recognition or code-based skill. Today, I'm gonna give you tips for both of these buckets that equal to proficient readers. And I'm gonna try and make it applicable for um, a range of age levels. Another thing, and this is, I promise, the only sort of other science-y re of reading thing I'll show you, but another thing that you may have seen around is called the reading rope. This has been around since 2001, and Dr. Hollis Scarborough basically went into multiple classrooms and did research on what are all of the skills that kids need in order to develop skilled reading. So she sort of created this woven strand um, image here or icon that has become really popular where you have vocabulary, 
knowledge, language structure, making inferencing um, and literacy knowledge at the top under language comprehension. And then you have sounds, phonics, and fluency at the bottom for word recognition. And all of those have to work together and become more strategic over time in order to get to reading proficiency. I'm gonna pause here, the last little bit of our science of reading overview. I want you to take a look at all of the strands of this rope and think about, or feel free to put in the chat, which of these strands causes the most frustration for your reader at home, or for yourself, or for students that you work with. You can think about it, you can pick a couple, or feel free to drop into the chat. I know for me that most of the elementary age students I work with really struggle with those bottom strands and making the link between sounds and phonics and fluency in order to become fluent readers. But if you have English language learners at home or um, work with them, you might notice that their code knowledge is super strong and they need stronger background in, um, knowledge and vocabulary at the top. So think about that today and think about the gaps that you see in your reader and your student as we go through these different techniques. We're gonna start with those bottom, bottom strands, word recognition. So how can we support our students with word recognition, building their awareness of sounds, of the sound letter link, and of reading and even writing fluency. So let's begin. There are those bottom strands. That's what we're going to be focusing on, sounds, phonics, and fluency. So the first thing we want to do with our students is encourage them to pay attention as they're learning to read to the sound first. Some of us, many of us, maybe remember we used to have letter of the day and we teach the letter name. That is not any more common practice. We want students to know the letter name, but it's even more important that they know the sound. And when you give them, um, when you give them a, uh, a letter symbol, you want them to be able to associate the sound that the symbol makes. Um, or when you give them a word, you want them to be able to break down the individual sounds in a word. So the first technique that I'm going to show you is, and I'm gonna go right underneath my doc cam, so see if you can see my pop it, there we go, um, is called the tap it out method. I love to use a pop it. Some teachers, they encourage tapping on fingers or on parts of your body or even tapping on the table, but especially if I'm working one-to-one -one with a kid who really benefits from this multi-sensory approach and the sound is so satisfying with the pop it, I love to use a pop it. And so here's how I would do it. I'll start simple at the top with a word that has two sounds or two phonemes. Say on, on, on. Good, tap it out. Aw, n, blend it, on. How many sounds does it have? Two. What's the first sound? Aw. What's the last sound? N, good. What's the word? On, nice. Now, actually, I should have started from here because we want to tap out in the direction that we actually spell. So let's do it now with a three phoneme word. You can practice along with me on your table. So I might say, um, for three phoneme words, I would pick what's called a C, B, C word, or consonant, vowel, consonant, short vowel, a sound, a, um, a word like cat. So let's do that. Sounds first approach, tap it out. Say cat, cat. Good, tap it out. We'll go left to right. At, blend it, cat. How many sounds in cat? One, two, three. Three sounds. Okay, what's the vowel sound or the middle sound where your mouth is open? Ah, ah, good. Now we can bring the letter. Ah, what says ah? A, that's right. A, good, tap it out again. K, ah. Cat. Nice job. Now, how can we use this with older kids? If you have students, and we'll, I'll talk about this in a moment, but if you have students who have a um, multisyllabic word that they are trying to spell and they don't know how to spell a certain part of it, um, like uh, speaker, 
speaker. Um, and they're confused about how to spell speak. You could ask them to tap out the sounds in the first syllable, e, speak, and then help them graph it, which we'll do next. And they can think about which vowel team makes that e sound. So the tap it out method, method is just really helpful to provide a visual cue. And it's also multi-sensory and to encourage students to start with sounds first, as that's how we're taking in information first and then to translate it into letters. Once you've gone from sounds, you can graduate to these at home. And this is, I bet these live on, on your fridge, right? So this is, I, I have a tiny um, uh, whiteboard here because I can't fit the whole thing under my doc cam, but this is a condensed alphabet arc. This is called the alphabet arc. And I have all kinds of letters here. In the science of reading speak, we say graphemes, but you can just call these letters. Letters or graphemes are the symbols that represent sounds. And so I would put them here in an arc. I could put this up on my fridge or any other magnetic surface. I even have tiles here that represent individual sounds where two letters come together to make one sound, like th for th or sh for sh. So once you've graduated from sounds first and just getting your kid to show you that they can break down the sounds in the word, you can then move to the sound symbol link and you can play a game like this. Hmm. Find the letter that says G. They would have to find it and then drag it into the center. Good. Bring it back. Find the letter that makes mmm. Notice how I'm guiding them not to tell me the letter name yet, but just the sound, sounds first. Find the letter that makes ah. Drag it, and then you can ask, what letter is that? What name? O, right, that's the letter O. What sound does it make? Ah. Push it back. So moving from just the sounds, to then recognizing which letters represent the sounds. And those are two really easy ways that you can, you know, just have this out and have this as a little warm up, even in the morning during breakfast with your big poppet. Kids love it. And they love to be able to also be a detective and find the letters that make a certain sound. I'm gonna go back to my slide deck for a moment. So once we are moving away from just teaching sounds, we also want students to be able to tell us, okay, which letters make the sounds? And I now need to write those. Thank you, Vanessa. And I now need to write those in as, um, as actual words. So I'm gonna grab my dry erase marker here. Um, and so once we're moving into words, we can um, use sound boxes with something called push and say. Push and say is really helpful for students who are just learning the code and you can give them a couple of boxes, you can draw it out. It can be like on an iPad in the car and they can tap and draw with their finger. Um, it can be on the fridge again or in the room um, somewhere and you can prompt them to be able to tell you what sounds and then what letters and then write the letter. So we're advancing a little bit forward. The way you can do this to make it more advanced with older kids is using the boxes to teach more advanced or reinforce more advanced spelling that they might be learning at school. Um, so if you're getting a list home from teachers about what are the spelling words they're working on, you can ask them to push and say if they're struggling to show you that advanced spelling. Um, or they could do this with parts of syllables of a longer word. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like for the um, sound boxes, just so you can see sort of the routine of it. And again, we're using a lot of manipulatives here. You can draw these, you can, but these could be clay, these could be dots, these could be, um, it could become sort of an art project at home. You can be kind of as creative as you need because what you're still encouraging students to do is think about individual sounds and how they translate into letters. So with this sound box, I might say um, patch, okay? So patch, we're gonna first tap it out. What are the sounds? P, A, Ch. One chip for one sound, 
one box, one sound. Now we're gonna push and say, what says P? Ah, what says A? Ch, what says? This is where if you know your student is working on TCH, you can give them words that help them practice that spelling pattern. And all three of those letters go in one box because they all make one sound. Ch. You can do this with simpler words like um, bit, b, i, t. Push and say, b, what says, b, i, what says, i, t, what says, t. And keep giving them words. The nice thing is that this forces students to go through the process of thinking about what sounds, how many sounds, which letters represent those sounds. And this is going to support them with long-term spelling or retention of spelling rules over time. So we're graduating now from just thinking about sounds to thinking about what letters make and then actually practicing the writing. This could be also a bit of handwriting practice for your students as well. It's a chance for you to check their grip on a pencil. With younger students, I encourage working with like a, a broken crayon or something that's easy for them to grip. And a crayon is nice because the wax creates friction on the paper. So it helps them to sort of build up the strength in their hands um, as they're learning to write. Now with your sound boxes, this is sort of an example. You can go from simple to more complex and you, can, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can talk to your student's reading specialist, talk to the teacher about like getting a quick word list. Ask, hey, what spelling patterns are you working on this month? And then you can use from those to give your kid a, a chance to practice or give your students a chance to practice and reinforce what they're learning. But rather than just saying, okay, spell this word, have them use the sound boxes as an added scaffold or support to think about sound by sound and then mapping the letters. Um, so here's an example on the right of how you could use the sound boxes if your student's learning magic E, which makes not into note. Okay, last little bit of sort of game here. I won't, two games, I won't model these, um, but these are something that I use all the time to get my students kind of excited and moving. One is called the fly swatter game. And if you have a wall somewhere that you are not afraid to let your students swat with a fly swatter, I don't have a fly swatter with me here, um, you can use this so many different ways to just get some energy out and then also reinforce uh, word recognition skills. You can put up words that are part of their spelling. You can put up high frequency words that students are working on and then say, find the word that starts with b, or find the word that means, if you wanna get into vocabulary, um, angry, mad. Find the word that has the ah vowel sound and give them different prompts to just swat. And again, don't reinvent the wheel. Ask your teacher for word lists. You can also use kind of a bingo approach. This is something I do often to have students find words while they're reading in text um, or say a word that they're working on, spell it and say it again, and then give them a bingo chip. And think about how you can gamify some of the learning that's already happening at home. And then also with your older words, when we're just thinking about word recognition, you can encourage them with longer words, multisyllabic words to break it down. Ask them first, how many syllables are in that? Or if they pause and they either don't know how to read it or they don't know how to spell it, ask them to say, um, if you're trying to spell it, ask them to say the word Think about how many syllables are in that word and then um, try and tap out the sounds by syllable to spell it using what they know about code knowledge. Or if they're trying to read it, have them draw a wall, which is what I call it, building up a wall around certain syllable types, um, looking for parts of words that are familiar, and then scooping each of those syllables to break down the word into familiar parts. We don't want students to guess at whole words, and we don't want students to have a sense of learned helplessness when they get to a longer word because they haven't memorized it. If they can decode one syllable, they can decode that syllable in the context of a longer word. 
And then last thing about code knowledge is your students, ideally, once they are learning a certain spelling pattern at school, are getting the opportunity to then practice it using a decodable text. What does decodable mean? We saw that with, that, with the sentence, kit ran and hid. That means that students have the phonics knowledge to be able to read all the words on the page without having to guess, without having to rely on context, and without having to know maybe more advanced spelling patterns that they have not yet learned. It is totally accessible to them, so it's decodable. I pause and say that this might not be happening at your schools because like we, this is the shift that's happening. Some schools are still in a more of a balanced literacy program where they are guiding kids to use what's called a three-part cueing system, which is look at the first sound, look at the picture, look around the word, and basically make an estimate based on context and meaning. And it's more meaning focused. And there are some benefits to focusing on meaning, but so many of our kids are struggling to decode because the emphasis has not been on decodable text. Let me give you an example of what would be decodable text. So on my screen is an example from an actual lesson that I did online with a student where you can see I taught the um, spelling pattern EE -E for the sound E. Make that sound with me. E. Good. So E has multiple spellings. And sometimes I use things called spelling trees where we map out all the different spellings for one possible sound. But in this case, I just had the student focus on words that used the letters E and E to make the E sound. So first we used our sound boxes, we tapped it out. Then we mapped out words like B, sweet, feet, sheep, and trees. The last part of this lesson involved a decodable text. Every single word on this page is a word that my student has the phonics capacity, the, the phonics skills to be able to decode independently. And so these are examples of words. Once I know what kind of skills that they've learned in class, I know what words I can ask them to read aloud. How is this relevant to you if you're a parent and it's bedtime? Sometimes we're really tempted to point to a word in a book and say, okay, what's that? Because you know they're learning that. But you want to make sure to avoid frustration and to avoid you feeling like you have to become the teacher that if you're picking a word for students to read aloud, that it's decodable. They have the capacity to tap the sounds and recognize the sounds and then blend it into a word. Um, you can see too that some of the words here are underlined in different colors. Um, those are what we call high frequency words that um, happen a lot in text. And I use a color coding system based on how familiar those are to my student. So let's talk about some code-based skills reminders and how you can help at home. The first is if you're gonna reinforce at home, use a sounds first approach. Whether it's your budding new reader and you're encouraging them to break down the sounds in simple two or three phoneme words or single syllable words, or it's your, um, your second, third, fourth grader even who's asking you, hey, how do I spell this long word? And you ask them to tap out syllables and then tap out sounds inside of the syllable. If your kid's stuck on reading for the one syllable word, have your student go sound by sound, tap it out like we did with kit, and then blend the word if it's decodable. For multisyllabic words, encourage your student to break it down into familiar chunks and then scoop to blend each of those syllables. And I can send out a format, um, sort of a template of how you could do that later with your student, but simply saying, try and break it down into parts that you know. And then finally, if you want to reinforce certain phonics skills and you know what they're working on or what they've taught at school, use decodable text. You're gonna avoid frustration and you're giving your students in that bat to practice skills that they have and not use guessing or context um, with what they don't have. However, 
I, I just recommend don't feel pressure to turn bedtime into phonics practice. You're, and we'll talk about this in the next phase, the next part. Let bedtime be a chance to be relationship building and a grounding moment and to build wonder and background knowledge and love of just books and learning. Um, don't necessarily feel that that needs to become your reinforcement phonics time. Um, even if you know a student can decode the word, they might not want to at that time because that's it's serving a different purpose in the moment. Okay, so we kind of touched on word recognition. Let's shift now into language comprehension. These are the upper strands of that reading rope, vocabulary, background knowledge, language structure like syntax, um, making inferences, um, and knowing about literacy, like knowing that a fictional story follows story elements that have a beginning, middle, end, or a rising action, exposition, falling action, resolution. So we can break it down here as well, but, and this is especially gonna be relevant for like your late second to, and third graders and beyond, middle schoolers as well, we, at, at this point, students are starting to learn about individual morphemes, say that word with me, morphemes, which are parts of words that have meaning, um, prefixes, suffixes, root words, knowing that mini means small, and when I see it in other words as a prefix, it's probably going to mean something kind of small, or that um, uh, s at the end as a suffix makes something plural. So, if students are struggling, not with reading, but with understanding what they're reading, first encourage them to break down a word into parts that they know. Um, do you recognize a beginning of prefix or a suffix or a root part? If it's the word audible, do you see that root word audi? And maybe we can think about other words that share that root. So encourage them to break it down, not to de decode it. They can decode it now, but to figure out what it means. And if you want to help reinforce what it means, I use bingo for this sometimes as a fun game, but um, you can encourage them to, to really start to like find morphemes or prefixes and suffixes inside of words um, and turn it into a game. Sometimes I have students search for all the prefixes that mean not, and they'll put a chip on un, dis, in, non, anti. Or you could sort of have a bingo card next to their reading, and anytime they see a prefix or suffix in their reading, they find it and put it in the bingo, and when they get bingo, they get a prize. Um, or you can even have like a family bingo with morphemes, prefixes, suffixes, root words, anything that you're like all deciding to use, like we're all going to use words that have un or non at the beginning, and um, find it in each other's speech. And when you hear someone else use it, you get to put something on your bingo card and it becomes like a family bingo. Get everyone to become a geek about language. It makes it so much more fun for them to learn background knowledge. And with that, we have to talk about vocabulary. So the number one way that students acquire vocabulary is through um, their environment and not through educational YouTube videos or TV, but mostly through their teacher's talk and through your speech. So as much as you can, and it's never too early, weave in those higher tier, those, you know, more academic vocabulary words in your speech with your students or with your kiddos, and then get them to use it themselves. Think about even a simple thing like, um, wake up, you know, right? Um, you know, um, how, can, how, can you be more alert or what can I do to help you be more alert right now, more awake and weave in that um, vocabulary use as much as possible. Don't shy away from it just because you know that they're a struggling reader, especially with dyslexic students. Their number one way of compensating for their lack of word knowledge or word reading knowledge rather is um, having a strong vocabulary and being able to show that off. Because when you put text in front of them, that can be jarring. But if they can talk to you about their interests and really 
talk with confidence and have a strong vocabulary, um, because they can elicit that word use themselves, they're able to feel more confident about themselves as readers and learners. And it helps to compensate for what they lack or where the deficit is until they're building in those gaps. So don't shy away, even with struggling readers, of using um, and having them elicit really academic or what we call tier two word uh, vocabulary use. And then last thing here, and I sort of mentioned this at the beginning of talking about the code-based um, tips and tricks, is your read-alouds. So if you are looking for a good book, um, there is a book called The Knowledge Gap by Natalie Wexler, which talks about how over time we have just stopped teaching history and science and certain major cultural moments and parts of literature in classrooms for a variety of reasons, right? And, and we can sit and go back and forth about what sort of things should be taught or not taught. However, because of that, because of the emphasis on, you know what, we have the internet, we have chat GPT, kids will just figure it out on their own. We don't have to teach them about the war of 1812, or we don't have to teach them about the slave trade because they'll, they have the skills to figure it out on their own. Students are ending up in eighth grade and high school with zero background knowledge. So when it comes to your, if you're still doing bedtime reading with your students, or you're maybe listening to an audiobook together as a family on your road trips, um, choose texts intentionally that are at least two grade levels above what they're capable of reading. Ask your students, um, reading specialist or teacher, if you need some support with great trade books, and use those as an opportunity to build background knowledge about history, science, and culture. Even if you're reading together is not an opportunity to reinforce the phonics skills, what this is going to do, and this is sort of in reference to a one question that I got earlier, is this is where you create the excitement about reading, even though your student might struggle with the reading itself. If I'm struggling with decoding, but I am so, I have so much excitement and wonder about um, this certain habitat that I want to learn more about. I have incentive to become a stronger reader so that I can access more of that information. So let your read aloud time as a family, nighttime reading, bedtime reading, um, even the movies that you might see together or audiobooks that you choose together, be a chance also to reinforce background knowledge. Um, as much as or even more than you are reinforcing your phonics skills. That is really something unique that you can give to your families, to your, to your students or your kids um, that may not always be the case in their curriculum at school. So let's review some of these. Um, hey, make it cool to be a linguist and talk about language as a family. Where does that part of the word come from? If you're a bilingual, a trilingual family, talk about cognates, talk about words in English that share common roots with Italian, with Spanish, with French. Talk about the differences between um, the meaning of one word in Mandarin and the meaning of it in English or how it's expressed. If your students are stuck on the meanings of words, um, Help them find any recognizable morphemes or parts of words um, and make a prediction based on their word knowledge. Um, or give them the word meaning explicitly. Go ask them a couple of questions about it, like yes or no questions about it, and then get them to use it themselves. And as much as you can elicit their word um, use, the, the better they can start to store that word in their vocabulary, their expressive vocabulary. Um, that's what I said, right? Elicit word use to strengthen their expressive vocabulary. And then use your read aloud time to teach knowledge and get them excited to gain knowledge. Um, even if you're noticing that your student is struggling with decoding certain words, don't let that frustration maybe seep into the nighttime reading. Let that instead be a chance to reinforce a love of learning to combat whatever is going on with word recognition. So can you believe it? 
We're 45 minutes in. I was told to stop right here, but here's our wrap up. So here's an overview of where we were today. Um, we talked about what makes reading difficult, talked a little bit about the science of reading, um, and then some tips and strategies that um, uh, that I use that are really fun, multi-sensory um, and creative that you can probably even build on more at home that can support birth, both word recognition and language comprehension. So I wanna pause here now um, and answer any questions. Um, and Christine, I'll let you take that over. Yeah, um, so that concludes the presentation um, portion of the workshop, but we have about 10 to 15 minutes for a open Q&A. And so um, attendees can go ahead and use the, um, the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to submit any questions that you have. And we also have um, some pre-submitted questions. So we'll start off with those and then we'll move on to any questions you submit in the Q&A box. So we'll start off um, with the first question, Natalie. Um, so it says, hi there, what is a good way for a kinder reader to remember repeating words so they don't reread it again? So I think that's a question about building the habit of self-monitoring or checking so that if your reader makes a mistake, they know to pause and go back and reread it again. Um, I think that, that that's how I'm reading that question. What is a good way for your kinder readers to remember repeating words so they don't have to reread it again? Um, so whether your student is working uh, you know, with a reading resource teacher at school or they do some kind of flexible grouping, small group instruction, or they're learning this whole group, um, ideally they're, they're getting a, um, some habits of, of self-monitoring or pausing after reading to ask myself, did that make sense? Um, and I would, the first thing I would do is if you're noticing that your reader is kind of just reading through a sentence and making a lot of errors without going back, um, I would uh, also not hesitate to provide them with a strong model. Um, Sometimes our students forget that the purpose of reading is to learn something from what we read and make meaning of what we read in addition to reading it accurately. So it's okay for you to model how you would read that accurately and making um, that strong model that conveys the meaning with your voice. Um, and then also model certain physical habits. So I like to go, you know, one word, one touch or one sound, one touch, go one phoneme at a time and then blend it as you're going through and then read the whole sentence through together. Um, so in terms of like self-correcting and self-monitoring, have them ask themselves after they read the sentence, if think about if that makes sense or think as they're reading. Um, if you're not sure if they were thinking as they're reading, you can always ask them, hmm, what did you just learn? And then they might go back or give them a strong model and modeling one word or one sound, one touch. Mm -hmm. And sort of relating to that question, um, I think Michelle um, asked, um, you know, if what if it's more specific to retention, maybe what are some strategies you can use there? That's a really good point. So we know, especially that it's so important to have um, explicit systematic instruction and the purpose of like a decodable text, for instance, is to provide as many at bats practicing using the taught phonics skill as possible. If the question is with retention, um, then that student just needs as much repetition of practice with those, you know, with, with first of all, the skill of, you know, reading sound by sound and then blending, and then skill of reading that explicit target spelling pattern or phoneme that, the, that they've been taught. Um, and if it's retention of certain high frequency words, um, you can, whether your school generates a list or you want to pull a list of like, you know, your common dolch sight words, for instance, you can encourage the habit of having them um, look at, spell, 
tap out sound and then read the word in isolation and in context. So it becomes part of their sight word vocabulary. They're just reading it fluently. Um, so it comes down to exposure, repetition, and practice. And, um, and I would also say that if you notice your student is going back and with the same word, maybe they are still always tapping out sound by sound and not reading the whole word. I, I would almost say that that's better than the fact that they have just memorized the, the word. They're still using the skill of going sound by sound to make sure they're reading it accurately. Um, yeah. Great, thanks, Natalie. Um, so our next question is, how can I get my son to appreciate reading more? I think that all comes down to finding material or finding content that is authentically engaging to your son. So your son is not going to appreciate reading because we tell him you have to read to get into college or you have to read to get a good job or you have to read because it everybody reads. You just have to do it. That's not going to be authentically engaging and motivating. This kind of goes back to what are you choosing as your bedtime routine books for building background knowledge at home? Um, and how can you find um, material that is authentically relevant and engaging that you are modeling a fluent read aloud of um, and, and, and engaging him in with discussion and conversation? Great. Um, and then a third question that we had pre-submitted is how to help my third grader to have resilience when she struggles with word and to find her love of reading. So it's kind of similar to the first two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I, I think it is. It is actually really helpful to have conversations, honest conversations with your kids about how genuinely hard it is to learn to read. So sometimes before trying to fix or come up with a solution. This is like a little therapy speak, right? But it's really helpful to pause and listen and seek to understand first. What is it that is so frustrating? And can you before offering um, even solutions, which is something she'll probably be getting at school maybe, or and it's maybe just not sticking, just start to try and understand the root cause of the frustration and empathize with how genuinely frustrating it is to learn to read. Maybe you can even use some of the things that you picked up today about how difficult um, word reading is and how difficult it is to learn to read in our language um, to build empathy. And then I would say two, thank you. Then I would say two different camps, right? The, the first is, yeah, find what genuinely engages her and is exciting and find material that you can use as a model read aloud for that. And then can you, you know, what, what is her learning style? Can you gamify or can you work with whoever the resource teachers is to, um, to just bring some like quick practice home for um, obviously, you know, what is the, what is the specific holdback? Is it in spelling? Um, but uh, as much as you can to, to find targeted practice so you can celebrate small wins every day and help to build um, motivation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, I, if there are no other questions um, right now, we will kind of, um, you know, conclude our time together. I did want to note that a recording of this um, workshop will be available on our YouTube channel and also our website, which is just strategiesforlearning.com. And then YouTube, it's just strategies for learning. Um, and it will send an email link out to everyone who's attended. And then we also recommend signing up for our email newsletters on our website. Um, that way you can receive um, email um, notices about any other upcoming newsletters that we plan to have, which we plan to have many, many more on various topics, whether it's early literacy or uh, math, executive functioning, college readiness. And so I recommend going to our website or just emailing me directly asking to be um, added to that newsletter. Um, and um, yeah, and I think that's that kind of concludes our time for today. So the recording should be available by the end of today's today's workday. Um, and I'll send those along and um, we'll also send out a feedback form to get an idea of what you thought of the workshop today and to get ideas for future workshops. So thank you all again for attending and we hope to see you guys all in future workshops. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks Bye. so much, Natalie. Thank Bye. you.